بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على من بوث رحمة للعالمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. When we read the news or watch the TV, we see the murder of innocent civilians, mostly Muslim civilians, around the world. And we see many Muslims, weak, oppressed, old women and children, being slaughtered around the world. And then we find that the perpetrators of these war crimes are portrayed as upholders of justice and truth. And in the same channel, in the same papers, you will find that Muslims are portrayed as extremists because of our different values. So we are told who to take our religion from. We are told who is moderate. We are told who is the extremist among Muslims. And no doubt this media plays a huge role in a war that is at least perceived to be against Islam. But the media war is nothing new. It's not new to this time. It's not new to this place. It's not new at all. In fact, if we go back to the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you find that he was attacked very severely by a very hostile media, a media of that time. In fact, in the very first proclamation to the Quraysh, you find a very negative response. The Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as you all know, he goes to the mountain and he calls the nobles of his family and he asks them a simple question. He says, if I was to tell you about an army that was behind this mountain, that was preparing to attack you, would you believe me? They said, yes, of course, you've never lied. He said, then, I am a warner, I'm a messenger of Allah, sent to you as a warner of a severe torment. Immediately, the media machine of that time began its work. Abu Lahab started by saying, Tabban lak, may you perish. And indeed, this was the family from among the family of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Subsequently, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was accused of many, many things. He was accused of being a sorcerer. He was accused of being a madman. He was accused of being a magician. He was accused of being a liar. He was accused of being possessed. He was accused of dazzling people with his poetry, of being a poet. He was accused of splitting people up, father and son, mother and daughter, husband and wife. In fact, they went further and they attacked his followers. They attacked them on the basis that only the poor people followed him. The oppressed ones, the slave ones, the backward ones. They said, we are the nobles. The nobles don't follow him. The intellectuals of that time, they don't follow him. So they used even world events to attack the message of La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah. They looked at the war that was happening between the two papas of that time. A mushrik pagan nation who had no scripture, the Persians on the one hand, who were supported by the Quraysh of Mecca versus the Romans, the Christian kingdoms or the Christian empire, the Romans, those who had a scripture. 
and they used this event where the Persians initially won the first war to say look we are upon the truth the people who don't have this scripture they're the ones who are upon the truth the Muslims of course they wanted the Christians to win that war likewise the event of Al-Mi'raj and Isra Al-Mi'raj when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam he told the people imagine this in a scenario in a circumstance where or in a context where people are very hostile to Islam they want any excuse to point fingers and point holes in this new founded religion for the time and Muhammad ibn Abdullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he now claims that he's gone to Jerusalem and back in one night what a strange thing and they took this the media of that time they use this to ridicule the people do you believe in this madman it takes us months to go to Jerusalem and he claims he's gone to Jerusalem and come back in one night but what was the response of the believers of that time some of them they apostated and this is the nature of such tests when the going gets tough when they can't handle what's happening in the media the pressure some of them apostated from Islam but the majority of them and from at the forefront, forefront of them was the great and noble Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu who said I believe in something greater I believe that he gets revelation from above the heavens every night subhanallah that's much greater than just going to Jerusalem and back in one night they brought ayat of the Quran and ahkam rulings to criticize this religion of Islam they took the idea the notion that it's no longer allowed in Islam to eat meat that has been that hasn't been slaughtered in other words the carrion the dead meat carcass that hasn't been slaughtered is haram when this law came into enforcement in Islam or when it came down the Quraysh they took they, they mocked the Muslims and look at the arguments that they brought they brought the intellectual arguments of that time they said look at this meat the meat that you eat is the meat that you slaughter as for the meat that is dead Allah is the one who killed that meat Allah is the one that killed these animals and you don't eat this meat but the meat that you kill you eat that meat only so they tried to confuse the Muslims try to pick holes in uh, in the Islamic law in ayat of the Quran in a hadith of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam and this is nothing new another example is when the Qibla was changed from from Jerusalem from al Bayt al, -Bayt al Maqdis to Mecca the Quraysh and the people they said what turned them away from their old Qibla and they started to try and cause doubts among the Muslims when the Prophet ﷺ was in battle, you find the mushriks would start spreading rumors, rumors that were baseless, unfounded. But it would spread in the media of that time. The people of that time would spread the rumors that Pro Prophet Muhammad ﷺ has been killed. Why? To demoralize the Muslims, to lesser their morale. This was all part of the media strategy against Islam you had rumors concocted by the hypocrite Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul against the very family of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam Aisha radiallahu anha was accused of the filthy crime that she was accused of radiallahu anha so therefore constant attacks against Islam is not something new 
They are not something new. It is something that started right from the inception of prophethood or the inception of messengership when the Prophet ﷺ was ordered to proclaim his message to the rest of the people. The poets in the poets of Quraysh, they would actually recite poetry attacking the Muslims and Islam. And at that time, the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ would order the Muslim poets to respond to that poetry, to respond. The media of the Muslims was asked to respond to, that, uh, to those accusations. So this is something, there is no issue in Islam except that people will attack it. And this will continue until Yawm Al Qiyamah. It's a fact. And there's nothing different today. We see them, we see people criticizing a cloth, a bit of cloth, a niqab. We find that at one time it was called the people who wore this cloth, this veil, were called oppressed. They were oppressed. But then as time went on, it kind of evolved into the same people that were oppressed are now no longer oppressed, they're extremists. They're violent, they're portrayed with guns and rifles in their hands when they are described in the media. So the same people that were oppressed 15 years ago, they were portrayed as being oppressed and weak, are now being portrayed as extremists and violent extremists at that. They say it's a mark of separation. The veil is a mark of separation. And what is really disappointing is how few Muslims stood up and said, yes, it is a mark of separation. That's the very point of the veil. It is a mark of separation between men and women. Our men and our women don't even mix. It is a mark of separation. They point fingers at the Sharia law such that the word Sharia, ah, despite the, the fact that in Islam, we have seen the Sharia ah law in place, and it was a golden age, a golden period, where crime was next to nothing. When the Sharia ah was actually enforced, people could walk around with freedom. You didn't have the widespread rapes or stealing, murder, every single day when we switch on the news, we hear about a murder, a knife crime, a rape, a this or a that. Every single day today. But when we have historical proof, we have it enacted that when the Sharia was applied in the Islamic world, you didn't have this kind of... Uh, this kind of... Um, filth and these kind of crimes being committed at such a, a wide or at such a huge level. Are we saying as Muslims that we want Sharia law to be applied in the UK? Yes, of course. Of course we believe that it is the supreme just system and way of life. In fact, the Archbishop of Canterbury he wanted parts of the Bible to be implemented in the daily lives of people in the UK. But do we want to shove it down people's throats? No. Do we want to force it down people's throats? Of course not. But what we're asking for is dialogue. What we're asking for is discussion. What we're asking for is to look and compare, have a look at these systems. Don't just brand it all with a paintbrush. That's what we're asking for as Muslims. So, the objective of the Sharia law is not to cut off people's hands. It's not to stone people to death. In fact, Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, the great scholar who died 728 years after the hijrah of the Prophet ﷺ, he said that between the time of the Prophet ﷺ until today, 
Not a single person has been stoned to death for adultery based on the four witnesses. It was only ever based on a person's own admission. Never. And Ibn Uthaymeen, rahimahullah, a scholar who died about 10 years ago, he says, and we say, between Ibn Taymiyyah's time and today, not a single person has been killed based on four witnesses stoned to death. So what's the point? The point, the primary point behind this is prevention, is as a deterrent. We don't want people's hands to be chopped off. But you have a system in place. When you have this God consciousness, when you have the whole system in place, then you won't have the kind of crimes that you have today. And that is what we as Muslims are arguing about. That is what we are talking about. We're not just talking about randomly killing uh, people. We're not talking about randomly chopping off people's hands. We're talking about discussion, dialogue on a proper intellectual level. But because of this great media pressure, because of the pressure at the time of Mi'raj, when people apostated and got confused, because of the pressure of today, when what we hear in the media, we find the same thing happening today. That Muslims who have been affected by these doubts and they have started to call for opinions which are totally alien to Islam. So it begs the question, who really speaks for Islam? What is Islam? Can anybody just talk about anything and it suddenly becomes Islam? Well, there are a number of issues that I think are important to mention. The first is those issues which Muslims have united upon. They have been upon the same way of thinking and practice generation after generation since the time of the Prophet ﷺ. In other words, an ijma, a consensus. When, and upon these issues, when the Muslims united, even if it's at a previous time, it is not possible to come with another opinion and then claim that this is from Islam. So generation upon generation, the Muslims have agreed that hijab is an obligation. Generation upon generation, scholars and layperson alike have agreed that Adam did not come from parents. He didn't come from monkeys or apes or anything of that nature. Generation upon generation, they agreed on the obligation of applying Islamic law in an Islamic state. Generation upon generation, they believed these things. So when you have, when you have this agreement, generation upon generation, it is not permissible, it is not possible to come with another opinion and then say, claim that this is from Islam. Not possible. Because the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, My Ummah will never unite upon misguidance. Never. So when the Ummah unites upon something, it is not possible for that thing to be wrong. Because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, My Ummah will never unite upon misguidance. In another hadith, My Ummah will never unite except upon the truth. So if the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who is the primary representative of Islam, is telling us that anything that goes against what the Ummah has united upon is not Islam, then nobody 14 centuries later can come and say this is Islam. So when the Ummah has united about riba, interest usually being haram, Generation after generation, it's not possible for somebody to come later and say that it is actually halal. Likewise, if there was a disagreement among scholars of the past over issues that were well known, and for example, let's say the scholars had two opinions or three opinions, 
If they had three opinions, it is not possible. It is not allowed for us to come with a fourth opinion for an issue that was well known at the time of the early Muslims. You can't come with a fourth opinion. Why? Because among the Ummah, let's look at it logically. Among the Ummah, they have united that it is not that fourth opinion. So therefore, they will agree that the truth lies between these three opinions. But by implicit understanding, that means they agree that anything outside of these three opinions is not representative of Islam or the truth. This is the second type of issue. The third type of issue is the new issues. Traveling by car, using a microphone, using television, all of these things, then in these matters, there may be some difference of opinion which, are, which is allowed. And the scholars of that time can debate and discuss and the fiqh councils can come with rulings for those matters. But the matters that we really want to focus on are the first and the second types of matters. Because it is haram, it is impossible, it is unlawful for somebody to come and claim that anything that the ummah has already united upon previously to now come and then go against a previous ijma or a previous consensus of the scholars of the ummah. So what is, what are we supposed to do? We should remember that no doubt the media is going to be against Islam. It's a fact. And this will continue until Yawm Al Qiyamah. We should be careful about what we relate to others. We should also remember very clearly that the rulings of Islam have profound wisdoms. And sometimes those wisdoms we may know about. And sometimes we don't know the wisdoms. For example, if you think about the stoning to death of an adulterer. Many people, they can't understand this ruling in Islam. And in fact, I was once speaking to a non-Muslim about this and he was saying how barbaric this is. And I said, <coughs> I, I, I explained that actually in Islam, for somebody to be stoned to death, you need four witnesses. And those four just witnesses have to see the act of penetration, the pen going in the ink, as they say. They have to see this. And in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu, four witnesses came forward, accusing someone of adultery. Three of them said, we saw the act of penetration. The fourth one, he said, I saw a man on top of a woman and he went into a bit more detail, but he had not seen the act of penetration. What did Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu do? He lashed the witnesses. Why? Because we are told that we are not even allowed to speak about this thing without four just witnesses who see the act of penetration. When I explained this to this non-Muslim, he said to me, well, if somebody does that in front of four people, he deserves to be stoned to death. <laughs> so, the point is sometimes we may not understand wisdoms of certain rulings. But when we actually think about it, when we ponder over it, ask the scholars and look at the wisdoms, then inshallah we will come to understanding the wisdoms and the conditions and what have you with regards to these rulings. But we should not be ashamed of our religion. We should not be ashamed because there is a very important principle here. And that principle comes back to a very important point. And that is that the Quran, if we believe that it is the word of Allah, then everything that is in the Quran is from Allah. It is divine and therefore it is the truth the whole truth and the absolute truth. أَفَتُؤْمِنُونَ بِبَعْضِ الْكِتَابِ وَتَكْفُرُونَ بِبَعْضِ Do you believe in part of the book and leave part of the book? Allah criticizes those who take part of the book and reject the other part. 
Just because we may not understand parts of certain rulings, it shouldn't mean that we reject those rulings. It shouldn't mean that we can't, you know, hold to that. Remember what Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu said, I believe in something much greater than that. I believe that revelation comes to him from above the heavens every single night. And this is a test. This is our test. Today, this is our test. How will we respond to the accusations against Islam? Either we can go away, learn about our religion, learn about the wisdoms behind the rulings of our religion, or we can be swept away in this media backlash. Rather, we should be ambassadors of Islam. We should learn about our religion and be able to portray it and relate to others in a way that they can understand that Islam was truly sent as a mercy to the whole world. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Jazakumullahu khaira. Assalamu alaikum.